I came into the world as an abstract sculptor, not a painter, and certainly not as a representational painter. I created sculptures in every way I could, carving, nailing, gluing, tying, stacking, and folding. Drawing made no sense to me at all. I didn't see the world as flat objects. Nor did I see the world as made up of stationary objects to be flattened onto a piece of paper. I loved splattering paint onto paper and boards, watching the shapes change as one color overlapped another, or when the colors bled into one another. What inspired me then, and what inspires me now, is movement through space. Trees bending in the wind, birds soaring, bodies dancing, water flowing, light flickering. I grew up playing games, board games, card games, marble games, mind games. My father made up games for us to play while eating dinner. My siblings and I took turns naming the planets from nearest to furthest from the sun. After dinner on Sunday, my father unlocked the vocabulary box into which we'd slipped pieces of paper with new words we'd come across during the week. Once a month, a dark blue mystery box with a yellow label came in the mail from a place called Things. Inside was an experiment or a game to teach us about gravity, perspective, illusion, light, or some other scientific wonder. My first color mixing spinning top was made from a Things kit. My gift at birth was not talent. It was insatiable curiosity. The world of two-dimensional art was mysterious and magical to me. I spent hours looking through beautifully illustrated children's books my parents read to me. The simplicity of the black lines describing figures, clouds, trees, and animals amazed me. Color combinations were magical, unlocking the universe of my imagination. As hard as I tried, I failed at making marks that pleased me or painting with colors that made my heart sing but I didn't give up trying. I knew I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to create magic on a piece of paper. It was a challenge I've never grown tired of. I was a very slow learner when it came to drawing and painting. No matter how many books I read about color, I didn't understand how to manipulate it and make color choices to achieve the results I wanted. I didn't understand grayscale value and how it was the most important element in two-dimensional art no matter how many books I read, I did not understand. We didn't have the internet when I was young. There were no tutorials to watch, and the few art classes I took were utterly useless. Plopping a still life on a desk in front of the class and telling us to draw it or paint it was of no help at all. When I couldn't even draw a leaf, how could I be expected to draw leaves, flowers, fabrics, pottery, and fruit all at one time? It would have been helpful if the tutors had done demonstrations for us, but they didn't. As I entered the ninth grade, my father influenced me once again, encouraging me to take both typing and Latin, skills he felt would serve me well in the future. He was absolutely right. Over the years, I was able to pay many bills typing manuscripts and dissertations for college students. Remember, this was the age before desktop and laptop computers for the general public. Latin class proved to be a turning point in my life, though languages are not one of my strengths. Fortunately, I managed to survive my first and only year of Latin class. During my junior year of high school, which was 11th grade, I was notified that because I completed a year of Latin, I was invited to join the Latin club on a trip to Italy over Easter vacation. I had enough money saved to pay for the trip because I had been working on a local farm. I signed up for the adventure. My father loaned me his new, small, 35 millimeter camera to take with me on the trip. Unbeknownst to me, that was the next major turning point in my life as an artist. The camera felt like an extension of myself, an extra set of eyes that connected my hands to my brain and my heart. I returned home with unusual vacation photographs. Rather than snapshots of the tourist attractions we visited, I had photos of forged hardware on giant doors, tiers of seats in the Colosseum, weeds growing up between stones in the Roman Forum, reflections in the water of the Trevi Fountain, and rows of dead dogs hanging in the windows of butcher shops. 
Seeing the world through the rectangle of the viewfinder changed the way I saw everything around me. I saved more money and bought myself an enlarger. I made black curtains for the window. After the sun went down, our kitchen was transformed into my darkroom. I switched from color film to black and white film. It was absolutely thrilling to watch the image materialize in the developing solution until it looked just right to me, the contrasts popping. At that point, I pulled it out and dropped it into the fixing solution. The blacks were the blackest black while still showing detail and the whites were the whitest whites while still showing detail. Fast forward, skipping over my year of living alone in Germany right after graduating high school, my two years at a commercial arts school in New Jersey, a year of working in a bio-research lab in New Jersey, two years of working as a waitress in Boston, and my first year attending Massachusetts College of Art in Boston. To put myself through college, I worked multiple part-time jobs. One of my jobs was cleaning house for a woman photographer. After asking several questions about the darkroom equipment, she tested my skills by having me print her contact sheets. Within a month, I no longer cleaned her home. Instead, I developed most of her film and printed all of her contact sheets and work prints. In addition to paying me, she became my mentor, giving me assignments each week and photographers to research. She insisted I learn the zone system, developed in 1930 by Ansel Adams and Fred Archer. Understanding the zone system was the next major turning point. You might think that by now I'd learned to draw and paint. No, I hadn't. What I'd learned was how to see. I could see and recognize patterns created by shapes, determined by the value tone of the shapes. I could see the differences between the photographs I took on sunny days when the range of values extended all the way from black to white and on dreary days when the range of values extended only from light grays to medium dark grays. I still didn't know how to see objects and colors. Because I couldn't see them, I couldn't replicate them on paper or canvas. As a result, my professors continued to suggest I find another occupation. Until my final review. I had to hang a selection of my work on the walls of the review room. Up until this time, no one knew I was doing any photography. It wasn't that it was a secret, it just wasn't drawing or painting. I didn't think to present my photographs to my professors. I was majoring in painting. I didn't even take a photography class. Earlier in the year, during a critique session that included the entire painting department, we were asked to each hang one painting. I hung the only painting I felt expressed my feelings and my passion for experiencing the world visually. I thought for sure it would receive a favorable response. Abstract Expressionism was still all the rage, and the students who painted abstractly were favored over those of us painting representationally. I was still stuck with the notion that I had to have skills painting representationally before I could think of myself as an artist and paint the way that my inner artist desired. A week before the critique, I'd wrapped a striped beach towel around a painting to transport it to the studio in a rainstorm. I'd flung the wet towel over a chair to let it dry. The way that it had fallen onto the back of the chair caused the stripes to appear like the ribbons of colored lights that had often danced through my head since childhood. My inner artist screamed at me to please paint the towel. I grabbed the biggest canvas I had and spent the next three days painting my version of the towel. When I was done, I was more pleased with the painting than I'd been with anything else I'd painted. Proudly, I carried the painting of the towel to the critique where it was nominated and voted to be the worst painting in the painting department. Imagine that. This was not a critique during which participants voiced their opinions and shared thoughts on how the elements of art had been handled in the paintings. This was a cruel and unjust judging of a student's attempt at finally expressing herself, guided by her inner artist. I left hurt and angry. The towel painting had flung open the doors to a new personal world of art for me, and I wasn't going to let the consensus of the students in the painting department stop me from further exploring this path, a path that bridged the gap between my inner world and my outer world. Rather than break me down, forcing me to find another occupation, the critique session made me tougher, stronger, and more determined to find my way in the world of art. I chose to hang the towel painting along with several other abstract pieces created after the nasty critique on the wall for my final review. 
I also hung a collection of 15 black and white photographs I printed at night in a borrowed darkroom. I didn't care anymore what anyone thought of my work. I'd become to be better acquainted with my inner artist and know what made her happy and how to observe the world in a way that brings joy into each of my days. I sat in a chair at one end of the room and watched the professors enter. As I recall, there were three of them. They hardly glanced at the paintings, all eyes locked on my photographs. All three approached the photographs with eyes opened wide. One professor turned and looked sternly at me as if I'd done something wrong. With an expression of shock and disbelief, he asked, who did these? A pretty foolish question, I thought, since it was the final review of my work, not anyone else's. I did, I replied. For 10 minutes, the room was silent except for the sound of their footsteps walking back and forth along the wall of photographs. I graduated from the painting department with honors in photography, having not taken any photography classes at all at Mass College of Art. I still couldn't draw well or paint well, nor did I know anything about color. I was on my own, still floundering to find where I fit in in the world of artists. I had to find a way to learn the skills I hadn't learned in either the commercial arts school or the fine arts department of mass art. My limited skills had been learned from artists with whom I'd apprenticed, sculptor Wayland Gregory when I was in high school, photographer Eileen Tomanoff when I was attending college, and painter Adolf Conrad before I attended college. These skills slowly improved due to the daily practice I developed after having been judged so harshly. Along with being insatiably curious, I am undyingly determined when it comes to learning how to draw and paint. I had to find a way to teach myself what I hadn't been able to learn in books or in schools. Finally, it dawned on me that I'd learned many skills as a young child because of the games my father made up for us. I decided to try making up games to learn to draw. I created many drawing games. The ones that worked best were based on my understanding of the zone system. Playing the games worked. I became confident in my drawing skills and excited about exploring ways to use them and to continue to improve upon them. Painting was still not a strength, nor was color. It wasn't until years later that I found a way to leap forward in my painting. Playing games worked with the drawing, and so it also worked with color. When I invented the color scheme game, it proved to be another turning point for me. It changed my experience of color as I see it in the world around me. I came to understand color by going back to the science of light and applying what I learned using the color scheme game. Never did I imagine the joy I now experience every day understanding color and manipulating it to express what I want it to express. The game changed my life as an artist and a teacher. A word about games. Unlike practice and exercises, games are played and meant to be fun. Practice and exercise sound boring and unpleasant. I like to use the word experiment rather than practice or exercise. Experiment sounds exciting and productive. An experiment has a beginning and an end. Practice and exercise go on forever and make me feel as if I will never get to my goal. It's just a mind game I play with myself in order to be consistent and look forward to my daily practice of drawing and painting. The game I present in this course is a game of shape manipulation with a focus on value, tone. Remember to think of this course as learning to play a game. Remember to be playful and to allow yourself to have fun and to try things you think might not work, just to see what happens. There are no rights or wrongs, no good or bad, and absolutely no mistakes to be made. Knowledge comes from all experiences. Allow yourself to take advantage of having as many experiences as possible. Mm -hmm.